Well, can you, brethren, say like the psalmist did? As I thought, the fire burned. I'll tell you, good preaching makes for good heart burning. As the Lord reasoned with those two on the road to Emmaus, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? And so I'm thankful for that, Brother Aaron, this excellent, excellent word. Now, what we have before us in Hebrews 2.17 is a text of summary. God sums up for us what salvation is really all about. And there are a number of these kind of summaries in Scripture, like Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. Once in the, in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. There are a lot of these great summaries in the scripture, but you'll notice in all these summaries, God is defining for us what the essential problem is, what the essential solution is in salvation, and what the ultimate outcome will be. Those are, those are critical matters to see that. Whenever Brother Given and I went down to India, Brother Given said it's very important that when we do this, when we go through this, because we are laying out so many details from what... <laughs> from Romans 1 all the way through 8, as we did, that there's got to be central things that we say continually that become kind of a foundation of, of reason that we come back to. So we're building on this single foundation. And there were these statements. I know, Brother Gibbon, you'll remember these. These statements. God is righteous and he can't wink at sin. Cannot do that. Brother, you're living in a generation that has entirely lost that truth. They do think he winks at sin, which is why they feel no urgent need to depart from it and flee from it. That's why they're not righteous, and yet at the same time profess faith in Christ Jesus. But this is true. God is righteous. He can't wink at sin. Man is utterly sinful and unable to stop sinning. He can't do it. Remember, just like in Isaiah 59, our sins multiply before thee. You can't stop it from happening. He's incapable of delivering himself. And this third thing, that God has provided a righteousness that is obtained by the faith of Christ Jesus. You don't earn it, but you did have to be delivered from an outside source. He's done it. You obtain it by faith. Now, all those issues are in this text in Hebrews 2. Every one of them. The issue of sin, the issue of unreconciliation is presumed... Jesus has provided a, a, a high priest ministry for us because he had to do this or else we couldn't obtain. And then ultimately the outcome is reconciliation. Those are critical things to see, brethren. Salvation is not, and these are all things that are accomplished under the banner of salvation, but they're not the essential aspect of salvation, although they're being made that today. Salvation is not deliverance from broken families. That's not ultimately, God didn't look down in heaven and say, look at all those dysfunctional families. We need to send a savior. That's, although some of those things can be resolved, but also some problems can be caused. That's not what is in his mind at all. Or how about this? Maybe you've heard this. Salvation is deliverance in order to be evangelistic. You not heard this? This is the main thing. God wants us to become alive and, and give us an understanding so we can win more. Sorry, that's not the essential issue. That's not why God saved you was for the world. Although that happens, but that's not why. That's not why. And if you have that view, you'll have a truncated view of what it's about. Or salvation is deliverance from dissatisfaction and purpose, purposelessness. I was kind of caught up in this, this kind of view. You appeal to people, here, you know, you're living an aimless life. When you come to Christ, he'll give you purpose. And he does do that, but... Is that really why we come to Christ? No, that's not really what essentially draws you to Christ in the first place. Or just dissatisfaction. I know you have a hole deep in your heart, and God can feel that. Maybe you've heard these kind of appeals to ungodly people, although you don't see those kind of appeals to ungodly people like in the book of Acts. The essential issue is you are a sinner. God demands you be righteous. He will not yield in this. If you, if you have one sin, you will go to hell for it. You have got to be made righteous. And when men see that, then he talks about this advocate 
that we were talking about today, who has given us a righteousness that is by the faith of Christ Jesus. Now, when you know those are the issues, righteousness is the issue, deliverance from sin is the issue, coming to God is the issue, then this really brings me to this exhortation. We must allow for God to define for us what are essential matters in life. If you major on minors, you won't make it. You won't. They distract. If you minor on majors, you won't make it because they distract you from what are the real issues in life. We cannot afford to do this. Brother Aaron said, Jesus brings the agenda to the table. He does not come to you with an empty pad and ask you what you want. It's already been defined by God. These are matters that pertain to God. And so we must allow them to define it. And since they have defined it in the way that Brother Aaron has talked today, we must be resolved with this exhortation. Sin must never dominate or even be named among us once. Just be resolute about this. Don't say we just can't, we can't stop sinning. That's just unbelief. That is not true. That is not true. How many exhortations we have in the scriptures? Sin not. If that's what he came to save us from, how can it be that his people continue in sin? This doesn't make any sense. And second, righteousness must be pursued. Pursue it. Remember, he, remember when Paul told Timothy, he was encouraging this young man, and he said, flee you for us and pursue. And a number of things he encouraged them to pursue, but one was righteousness. He's telling the church to pursue righteousness. Well, I thought we'd already had it imputed to us. We do have it imputed to us, and thus we can pursue it more and more. This holiness and righteousness that God requires. And thirdly, coming to God is the ultimate end in life. So we must be resolute about this. If we don't get anything else done, we're getting this done. We're coming to God. Amen. We're cultivating that fellowship with him, and we're increasing in that fellowship with him, because that's what salvation's all about. That's what God has to give. He said to Abraham, he says, I am not exceeding great reward. That's what it is. And so we pursue that. Amen. Now, the thing about these three things that I've mentioned is that they're all entirely impossible, except that Christ, as Brother Aaron said, represent us and work these things in us. You can't say no to sin without Christ. You can't pursue righteousness without Christ. And you certainly can't come to God without Christ. All these three things are essential matters. And so it brings me to this last exhortation. What would distinguish us from anyone else that's in the world? Why would Christ work on our behalf and not on the behalf of another? This is the commandment that we have from him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his commandment. And I like what Brother Aaron said. He says, those who are clinging to Jesus receive the benefit of his faithfulness to God. Amen. That's what this is essentially out. Amen. This is what distinguishes between men, believer, unbeliever. Uh -huh. yeah. And belief isn't just talk. As we know, a person who has real faith, he acts upon it. Jesus Amen. Christ is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him, God. pursue him. And so this is an encouragement for us to do this, to look to Jesus in faith, to believe on him as God has represented him. And to, in everything we do in life, it become the overflow of our persuasion of who Christ is. Mm -hmm. 